While you're being seated, if you turn your Bibles, you ready for the book of Malachi? Uh Uh-oh. That's that book again. But we're going to learn something uh, regarding the supernatural has been given. The very reason for Easter is a supernatural aspect of life has been given to you and me. Before we get started, I thought this was pretty funny. So as I heard about this mother one Sunday morning, she went into her son's bedroom and she said, son, wake up, it's time to go to church. The son kind of groaned and rolled over and said, no, mom, I'm not going to church today. She said, what do you mean you're not going? Why not? He said, mom, I'll give you two good reasons. First of all, I don't like those people. And number two, they don't like me. Mom contemplated for a moment. She said, son, that's really no excuse. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you two better reasons why you should go. Number one, you're 59 years old. (laughs) And number two, you're the pastor. Love you all. Before I get into the Word of God, I must share with you my excitement that I have my uh, spiritual mother here, Beverly Bradford, and her amazing, wonderful husband, Ralph. Amen. Amen. And then, really good friends. They were elders in the church for many years, Ed and Carmelita, uh, just amazing people, godly people. If you really want to understand prayer, uh, you can talk to them because they are prayer warriors, and uh, I love them, always have, Uh, and Ralph and Ed, um, they're my golf buddies too. And we've had a lot of time with Ed. I had a lot of times with him, and we grew together in the Lord. And I was on staff. He was an elder in the church, and we grew together in the Lord. And I so appreciate you being here. It's such an honor and a privilege. Um, As you well know that um, who I am today has a lot to do with Beverly and uh, for how she spoke into my wife and myself. And if I say much more, I'm going to get emotional, but this is the reality of what relationship is all about. And when you understand that we have a relationship with the Father, then you understand these type of relationships. And the love that is there, it's not that you talk every day, not that you... uh, are spending time together, but it's because these relationships. And I have many more, and Beverly uh, has many more, uh, but the reality, this is what God does when we come together understanding uh, that true relationship with the Father. So we've been talking about aligning ourselves to walk in the miraculous or the supernatural, the reason for Easter. We explained to you uh, the last couple of weeks about the authority of God that has been given to us. It came from the Father. We made a bold statement that we don't see answers to prayer like we should due to the lack of authority and due to the lack of the relationship we have with Father God. Remember, we talked about how there's a There's an essence that we always talk about Jesus, which we should, and we talk about the Holy Spirit, which we should, but we really don't recognize relationship with the Father. The very reason why Jesus came was the Father loved us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And the only reason why that Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit, because as the Holy Spirit was going to reveal us to us the truth and the reason for Easter was to create a relationship with the Father. And so we're learning that the miraculous doesn't happen 
as much in our lives is because we really don't understand and pursue, like we sang today, that relationship with the Father, Father God. Yes, what we celebrate the Easter is that God became a man, was crucified, and three days later was risen and took captivity captive. But let's look at Malachi 3, 7 and learn again from Israel and their actions or lack of actions. In Malachi 3, 7, it says, Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Now, I know a lot of you were getting nervous because you thought I was going to talk about the tithe again. But uh, we are going to touch on it today. But let me uh, give an explanation of the book of Malachi. And you really need to hear it because a lot of people steer away from what I think is one of the most hidden or the most important books that you could read and understand is the book of Malachi. This book is about returning to God about us coming to back coming back to God. And I would say to every one of us today, me included, is there are areas in our life that we need to return to God. We need God to return to us because it says he it says here if we return to him he'll return to us. What is this talking about? We're going to ask some questions today and we're going to try to answer them. We need God's presence in the church, don't we? We need to understand that the the pursuit of that presence draws the love of God. We need God's power. We need God's miracles. We need his love. We need his mercy. And we need his grace to return to us in fullness. That breakthrough that we've been uh, experiencing uh, greatly, many of you online, and But we have to understand it's a pursuit and understanding of what this returning is. And I believe, let me just share with you, I believe much of the returning is focusing on the Father and the love of God. Chapters 1 through 3 in Malachi, there are four chapters. Chapters 1 through 3 covers three areas in chapter 4 is talking about the coming of the Messiah or the Son of God. The last book is talking about the Messiah coming soon. In chapter 1, God says, you need to return to me in worship. Have personal devotion and worship to him. The Father is drawing us, a valley community, and many who watch us and the churches that are learning from us, uh, God is asking us to return to him, the Father. Of course, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It all works together. We covered that already. But in returning to the Father and recognizing this love, because remember, we understand of the three areas of relationship we have to work with. The second chapter, God says you need to return to me in your family. Your family needs to serve him. There needs to be an extra step towards serving the Father and hearing his voice and understanding his will for your home, for the culture of your family, for what God has said to you. Because remember, uh, Scripture always talks to us about the four generations. Okay, a, a curse, four generations, or blessings. But see, bottom line curses four generations, but blessings are to over a thousand. Chapter three, God says you need to return to me. Here it is in the returning of your tithe and giving of your finances. We always say God first, family second, but what's third? It's giving. But let me just give you a caveat of our next series. We always say God first, family second, and then, you know, the the giving or finances or whatever in that area, what that includes. But I believe that when we understand the relationship of the Father is 
Remember how Jesus said, what I say, anything that I say or do is what my Father has already said and, do, and done. And then Jesus tells us about the Holy Spirit. It's expedient. It's important that I go away so that we can give you the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit will do is he'll show you me, which then in turn will show you the Father. So it's all about relationship. So let me just say this. In your marriage, we always say in your home, God first, spouse second, and so on and so forth. Well, let me tell you, when you really understand a relationship, then your spouse becomes first. Because if your spouse becomes first, then you're really understanding the heart of the Father. And by doing serving your spouse, you are serving the Father. And that's why there's, there's uh, miracles are not taking place in our homes today because our, our reality of this is, you know, w- w- sometimes we use excuses of, well, you know, I think Father would want me not to do this and so I don't do this for my spouse. And we end up in divorce. See, the breakthrough that I believe is going to take us into, okay, here's a, uh, my opinion of the, pro- the pr- prophecy of the return of Jesus, is when we finally get it together about loving and relating to the Father. It's going to transform our homes and our churches, and from that transformation, then I believe that the Father is, will look over at Jesus and say, it's time, and he will return, and the church will be raptured. Your home is literally what God wants to see that will prove God. That's our next series. I'm committed to teach you in every area of your Bible, your relationships, regarding God, your family, regarding giving. But I want to walk in the supernatural in a greater way. I want you to walk successfully in the gift, or as we would say, the motivational gift that God has given you. And it's all coming about, the reason for Easter is to create that relationship, to to uh, rebirth that relationship that Adam and Eve had with the Father. Romans 12 tells us about seven gifts that God gives to man, and all of us function in at least one. These gifts motivate you and drive you to accomplish what God's called you to do in your life. Have you, ever, have you ever done this? Have you ever uh, thought, why did I do that? In a lot of instances, unless the flesh led it, a lot of instances is because that's the gifting that you have in your life. That's why you do the things that you do. You can live in the miraculous and you can live a life relating with God, loving your family, and be an extravagant giver. Malachi is telling us to do three things. And it's regarding your heart and what truly is in your heart. So let me say that in another way. As we learn about the benefits of the kingdom, submission to and walking in loving authority, giving is the main action your life will do in every area of your life. It's not just money. It's about giving. It's about being a giver. It's about being gracious. So Malachi 3, verse 6 and 7 says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, In what way shall we return? It's always the questions of us, mankind. What way? What do I need to do? 
What do I need to say? What do I need to do? How do I need to think? So the question we should ask, in what way should we return to you, God? It's not about an action of doing which will follow, but it's literally about the heart saying, where do I need to change because God doesn't? Are you hearing that? Where do I need to change because God doesn't? Did you know that God's plan for you never changes? We change God's plan because we, ch- we change sometimes to the opposite of God's plan. But the answer here of where should we return to God is found in the next few verses. Will a man rob God? We talked about this. You know what that means, robbing God. Yet you have robbed me, but you say, in what way have you robbed? Uh, have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? All right? This is saying, I can rob God, watch this, of the ability to bless me. By you not tithing, by you not giving, we've covered this, you're not robbing God. He owns everything. All right? What we're robbing him of, of the ability to bless us with kingdom blessings. And remember, what is that curse? The curse is now we have to depend on the world's economy. I'm depending as a tither on God's economy because I don't rob God from that because I'm a tither. And so there are people who are asking questions. Remember, question, question, question. Why does this happen to me? I'm telling you is that when we understand relationship with the Father in every area, then these breakthroughs that we've been praying about for ourselves, our homes, our businesses, our families, our church will just explode in the miraculous. So follow me with this, verse 9. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation, okay? You have now allowed this world to rule you. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food for my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Hallelujah. Get excited. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of the ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Malachi is such a powerful book, returning to God. So this portion we just read was what God wanted to point out regarding our heart, regarding him, regarding our family, and regarding finances, and regarding our businesses, marketplace. The Father so loved the world that he gave us the ability to relate with him. Malachi raises some questions. And so what we're going to do is we're going to answer four questions today, what Malachi raises. First of all, here's number one, does God change? Malachi 3.6 says, for I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. You know why? (laughs) Because our actions, my actions don't change God, so he doesn't consume me. So here here it is. Does God change? No. Did God change between, you hear this before, between the Old and the New Testament? No. Was God mean in the Old Testament and nice in the New Testament? No. He's nice in both. God doesn't change. Were, Were people saved by the law in the Old Testament and by grace in the New Testament? No. Church family, we're going over what we have covered the last two months. Not one person has ever been saved by the law. Matter of fact, let me read this to you again. 
Romans 3.20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Verse 13, For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now, Genesis 6 says this. We're not going to read that. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So it's always been of grace. Every person that has ever come to the Lord comes through grace, not through the law. It's not being good, or as you know my famous word, or gooder. God does not change. Of course, we're in the New Testament, and we're under grace in the writing and not under the law. But what does that mean again? We have to keep going over this because the enemy comes in with deception. And the, the more we grow in the Lord, which we're growing big time, the more we grow in the Lord, we become more law. Well, I did this, and I did this, and I did this, and that's why I did this. I have this or I'm living this way. I want to tell you, church family, it's of grace. Everything that you are is of grace through faith. Everything that you will accomplish in life is by grace through faith. So let me just show you some examples, all right? Murder was wrong under the law. Guess what? It's wrong under grace too. Adultery was wrong under the law, and it is wrong under grace. So here's my thought on this. Malachi tells us, returning to God is right under the law, and it's right under grace. Are you following the thought process here? A righteous family is right under the law, what you do. And it's right under grace. Tithing and giving offering is right under the law, and it is right under grace. In verse 7, remember I slowed down on a word, and it's the word ordinances. The word ordinance comes from the word order, means a principle of order. Now follow this. God says, You have gone away from the principle of order. From my principles I gave you to keep your life in order, to keep our relationships in the areas where they need to be the way I created them to be. Again, tithing is one of those principles. Tithing was established 430 years before the law. So Hebrews 7 says, when you tithe, Jesus himself receives the tithe. When I put my tithe in the box over there, Jesus receives my tithe. Many of you, you're tithing online. When you click that button, Jesus receives your tithe. But again, murder is still wrong in grace. Adultery is still wrong in grace. And I'm really happy to be under grace, but let me tell you about grace. Grace asks for more than the law asks for. 
Just think about that. Grace requires more of me than the law requires. To sum up grace in one word is the word Jesus, full of grace and truth. Matthew 5, 21, Jesus is talking, and he's talking about uh, murder, and you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. So funny, people always quote the Ten Commandments on TV. Well, doesn't the Bible say thou shalt not kill? No, it doesn't say thou shalt not kill. It says thou shalt not commit murder. There's a difference. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But watch what Jesus is saying. But I say to you that whoever, this is grace, is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, or I curse you, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. So the law says, don't murder. Grace says, don't be angry with sin. Verse 27, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you should not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. See, grace asks for more of us. Why? Because it's out of the heart. Because there are a lot of people that don't have the heart of God, but they do good things. And what God is saying, return to me in the principle of relationship. Return to me in the principle of of what I'm asking you to accomplish in your life. You're growing in the Lord. And how many of you growing in the Lord have made mistakes? Yeah. Again, I have to raise all my hands, feet, fingers, toes, and then borrow yours too. So, But he literally brings out the reality is grace is asking for more. That's what true relationship is about. I'm so glad you and I are under grace and not the law because it's regarding our relationship with the Father. It's giving everything we are to him. So being under grace, you do more and give more than the principle. Seeking God, you do more. Loving your wife, your kids, your family, you do more. You, get, you return your tithe, 10%, and then you give more. Deuteronomy 16.16 16 says this, Three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Here's a key of relating with the Father. Come to him not empty-handed. Come to him with an attitude of giving, an attitude of loving him more, of when he asks for more of you. Be so happy that your Father has asked so much more of you, and you do it with gladness. Through the years, I've had uh, people ask me, well, if I do more for my spouse, what if they take advantage of it? God has never changed. Serve him with all your heart. Love and protect God's plan for your family. And your tithe belongs to God. He's never changed. So whatever is asked of you, do it with gladness. Here's here's my statement to you again. For my wife, it's not 50-50. I give 100%. I create a culture. I create an avenue 
in my home for my wife. Could she take advantage of it? Of course. Anybody can. What? And has she? Ask her if she has. She might be watching right now. I'll have a message on my phone. Just kidding. But what has God said to you? See, it's based on a relationship with the Father. If we don't understand relationship with the Father, then when we have the questions, what do we do? How do we handle it? What do we do with this and this? We will never have the answer because our answer will be of the flesh. It will be how we feel. If they hurt me, if they did this. Here's the second question. Do we need God to return? Do you need God to return to you? God says, return to me and I will return to you. Again, Malachi 3, 7. Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord. And then they say, well, which way? What way shall I return? I will tell you, every one of us need God to return in areas of our life. In Judges 6.12, the Lord appears to Gideon. Watch this. Watch the principle and watch the truth that I give you. And don't take it as an offense. Don't take it as in, well, that's not me. Take it as in, in areas of my life, what I have done is I've thought the way Gideon, Gideon thought of in this action. All right, let's read it. Very important. If you don't get anything today, get this. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him, Gideon, and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Ever ask that question? I've served the Lord, I've gone to church, I've tithed, I've done this, I've done the extra, I serve in a ministry, I do all this. How come this happened to me? Then he says, and where are all the miracles which our father told us about? Our fathers experienced this, miracles. How come we're not experiencing it? Sounds like today, huh? Basically saying, if God is with me, how come I'm not seeing a miracle? Verse 12, look at it again. And the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and said to Gideon, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. He didn't say the Lord is with Israel, but he said the Lord was with Gideon. Why? Because Gideon had not departed from the Lord's ordinances or the Lord's principles, but Israel had. Okay, follow this. And I know last week and this week, we've been a little bit strong here. But how many of you are happy that your pastor's not afraid to say the strong stuff? About half of you. Okay, anyways. <laughs> See, Gideon misunderstood. He said, if God is with us, why don't we see the miracles? God wasn't with us. Speaking of Gideon, he was with Gideon. The Lord said to Israel, And Malachi says, if you come back to me, I will come back to you. So what do I do, pastor? Let's return to the Lord. Just today, just make a step. If if you know in your own life, the areas of your life, you have backed away from the Lord, just return to him in that area. Just do it today. Now, the scripture didn't say, and then... God's going to think about it. He might let you wait a long time. He might do the, you know, no. 
He says, I then will return to you. Now. So what do we need to do? Return to God in three areas. Return to the Father. Relate with Father God also. Relate with your family, the relationship you have with the Father, and relate with your finances. Three areas. So now let me blow you away and say this again and again. Tithing is not giving. It is returning to the Lord what is already his. Tithing belongs to God. Remember the parable of the talents? He gave five to one person. He gave two, and then he gave one. The one with five talents returned five more. Gave more, five more. God says, well done, faithful servant. Watch this. Returned five, returned five and gave five. The one with two talents, he returned the two. That was his. And he gave two more. He said, well done, faithful servant. The man with one talent buried it and gave it back to the one. And he said, this one's yours. And what the Lord did is say, you wicked man, you only gave back to me what was already mine. Grace that you do more in every area of your life. You give more to God. You relate more to the Lord. You give more to your spouse, to your family. And you give more than returning your tithe. Notice what he said. (laughs) Okay, if you read this exactly what it is saying, I'm a tither and he just called me lazy. Okay, I'll say it a different way. All of us tithers, he just called wicked and lazy. Because bottom line, the principle is, we're returning what's not ours that was already his, and above and beyond is what produces the miraculous in your life. See, everything that I give above and beyond is out of this grace that I'm doing more. Everything that I give to Terry, to my wife, in loving her, is above and beyond, is, causes a blessing in my life. And God returns to me and opens the door and creates the culture in your home of blessing and not an and agreement and not disagreement. So I don't even have to ask, what if she abuses this? Wow. Amen. And so when you do that, what happens is you open up the windows of heaven. Now, I would never think of calling myself or you wicked and lazy in your returning the tithe. Bless you. But let God do a work in your heart, returning to him. Here's another statement I want to make. You know, we're born physically selfish, but we're born again generous. We're born takers, but we're born again givers. And we need to return to the Father in this area. The third question is, Is there really a curse? Malachi 3.9 says you are cursed with a curse. Remember, the curse is that you will then, if you do not abide by the principles, you will live in the world's economic spiritual system. But because I am walking, returning my tithe, and I am doing the best of my ability, make mistakes, 1 John 1, 9, I have to go to the Lord, ask him to forgive me. And he is, he is faithful and just to forgive me of those sins, living that lifestyle. But the reality is, is returning to the Lord, this curse is that the world's economy, the world's relationships, 
the world's offense, the world's unforgiveness, the world's deception is always clinging upon people who love God and are trying to destroy the very things that you're believing for. And let me tell you, you are believing for great things because you're great people. But I'm talking to you about how do we, like Gideon, how do we get the miracles that our fathers experienced? It's by returning to the Father in every area of our life. Amen. Someone tried to make me feel better last week because we were really strong. And a lot of times when you're strong as a speaker, people get quiet. And they came to me and said, Pastor, we're just quiet quiet because we're really trying to think about what you said and learn from what you said. I said, no, you're quiet because it's uncomfortable. (laughs) Right. That's okay. I read the Bible, I get uncomfortable too because I find in my own life that I struggle in areas myself. But the Bible says Jesus bore this curse on the cross. The Bible said he bore our sin on the cross. So let me ask you this. If he bore our sin on the cross, have any of you ever sinned after you became born again? Well, Matthew 8, 17 says he bore our sickness. Have any of you ever got sick after you're born again? Galatians says he bore our curse. A curse is a consequence. Anybody fell into consequence in your life by wrong decisions? Okay. So in other words, he's saying, Malachi is saying, if you do this, not returning, there's consequences. If you murder someone, you're going to jail. If you commit adultery, you're going to die. I mean, there's a consequences. If you don't return to the Lord, consequence. You don't turn family to Christ, your heart to Christ, there's consequence in the family. If we don't return the tithe, there's consequence. Again, in all this, it's the world's system. It's what happens, that curse. It's not that God places a curse on us. He doesn't. But it's the principle, it's the ordinances that Malachi is saying, we must return to the Lord. It is the principles that when he was, he was talking to so many people, from Moses to Isaiah, you know, to everybody, he's saying, listen, return to me and I'll open up the windows of heaven. But if you don't, you block the blessing of heaven. You rob me to take care of your family, to change your family, to change your business. You rob me of that because that's what I want to do. That's the heart of the Father, to bless you. That's the heart of the Father. Hmm. Joshua 6, 18 and 19 says, and you by all means abstain from the accursed things lest you become a curse when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasure of the Lord. When did he say that? Just before they went into Jericho. And remember the one family took, hid it underneath their their tent and God says, you take it to my house, give it to me, return it to me, I will bless you. You take it to your house, you will be cursed. Worship is for God only. Here's the fourth question. Is there really a blessing? We found out there's a curse. Yeah, there's really a blessing. Look at verse 10 through 12. It all belongs to God. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Remember the storehouse. What is a storehouse? A storehouse is a place 
where you store in abundance. Did you know that Scripture tells us your homes are storehouses? Yeah. It's not just the church. But God wants you to have abundance in everything that he's planned for you. But it's living out the ordinances. So let's conclude with this. If I will, watch this, try me, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord. All right, I don't have a farm. So this scripture, it means nothing to me. No. Your job. Moms in your home, God will bless you with wisdom and insight with your children. Businesses, the marketplace. Hundreds of people will become born again because of your heart regarding your business because you give above and beyond. So is there a blessing? Yes. It's called the protection of the Lord. All three areas of returning to the Lord, again, represents your heart and where your heart is. Where's your heart? What is God saying to you regarding areas of your life? What questions do you have? The bottom line, the questions you have the answer will always be return to the Lord. Whatever's gone on in your life, whatever you've experienced, the questions that you will have are going to be answered by return back to the Lord. Let's all stand, and I want to conclude with one more statement. Remember the verse in Matthew 6, Verse 21 says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So Malachi, in returning to the Lord in everything, is saying, treasure God. Treasure the Father. Not just Jesus. Not just the Holy Spirit. But understand, all this came out of the heart of God. For God so loved you that he, he exampled it, he gave. Abundance is yours. It's not a question whether is it or isn't it. God, did you call me? You know, a lot of people, some people think, I've been called to poverty. No, you haven't. If you're living in the physical world mentality and economic system, you're going to stay in poverty because the enemy is going to rip you off every time you gain a little bit. But God says, I'm going to bless you. I'll bless your children. Your children and your children's children will just absolutely explode with abundance. It'll be a storehouse of spiritual blessings. Why? (laughs) Because you made a decision to return to the Lord in those areas. Allow me to pray for you and everybody watching online. In Jesus' name, we come before you thanking you, Father, for the Holy Spirit that gives us mighty revelation. In Jesus' name, I come against spiritual deception. I come against physical deception of the eyes that we can see the truth, and that truth will set us free. I release Valley Community Church Everyone that is listening and watching us, in Jesus' name, walk in abundance.
by returning to the Lord in every area of your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give a Lord an applause. Praise the Lord. I love you all. God bless you. Have an amazing evening.